to answer any of your questions through there. And then, yeah, so I did my undergrad at University of Manitoba. Um, I did my Bachelor of Science in Psychology and Biology. Hi everyone, my name is Laurel. Um, I am also a first year student at the University of Manitoba in their Master of Physician Assistant Studies program. Uh, I'm 29. I have my Instagram uh, PA account linked up at the top there. Again, as Dana said, feel free to send me any messages asking any questions about the application process. I'm happy to help. Um, my background education, I've been a paramedic uh, in rural Manitoba for about seven years uh, and I just completed my undergraduate degree in nursing so I'm still working as a paramedic and a nurse throughout my program. Um, yeah I was up, uh, my first year applying last year and, and got accepted so I'm really thankful for that and I'm excited to be here. Awesome so up next is four McMaster PA students Heidi, Jamin, Olivia and Felina. So hi everyone, my name's Heidi and as Prada said, I'm a first year McMaster student. I'm 24 and I graduated um, my undergrad degree in chemical engineering from Laurentian University. I also did a certificate in gerontology during my time there. So kind of approaching uh, my PA journey from a little bit of a different route, but if any of you out there are coming from maybe like a, a non-biology background, it's okay, you can do it. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. I'm originally from Whitby, but I now say that I'm from Sudbury because I haven't lived in Whitby for six years because originally I went to school in the States for two years. Um, I did varsity running down there, so I ran uh, the one level and then I transferred to Laurentian and finished my degree up there. Um, so yeah, if you guys want to reach out to me, my Instagram's there and I can also take emails um, and I'd love to chat with any of you about anything. PA. Hello friends, my name is Jamin. I'm actually 22 today. Um, did my Bachelor of Science at Mac, um, similar to Prada, and then I think it was Dana who said she did a, um, an honors bio and psych. So I did honors biology and psych, neuroscience and behavior, so pretty close. And then I was also working on campus as a tour guide, which is kind of fun. Um, so any questions about Mac in general, I'm pretty, pretty equipped to answer if you have any of those. Um, feel free to message me as well as obviously anything about the future. Hi everyone, my name is Olivia. I am 25 years old. I did my Bachelor of Science specializing in kinesiology at Queen's University prior to being a first year student at McMaster. <laughs> I applied to all three schools, but was um, very lucky to be accepted at U of M and McMaster. Originally, I'm from Toronto, and some of my extracurriculars include being um, an athlete in Olympic level windsurfing, as well as doing some kiteboarding as well. I'm also happy to answer any questions, whether that be by email or my Instagram. My information is listed on the slide. Hi, everyone. My name is Selena. Um, I'm 23 years old. I'm also a first year physician assistant student at McMaster. Um, in terms of my education, I have a honors bachelor of sciences degree from Brock University in medical sciences. And I also recently just graduated from my master of public health um, degree also at Brock University. Um, I applied to McMaster and the University of Toronto, and I was fortunate enough to gain experiences to both schools, but ultimately chose to attend McMaster. Um, I am from Hamilton, Ontario, more specifically Stony Creek, so that's like 15 minutes towards Niagara. And um, as the rest of my colleagues said, my DMs are always open if anyone wants to chat, anything PA related. Um, my email's also there, but I check my Instagram more frequently, so um, that's my preferred method. And in terms of my hobbies, um, when I'm not stressing about PA school, I love spending time with my friends and family, um, going to the gym, um, playing with my dog. So that's a little bit about me. Beautiful last is at uh, University of Toronto where we have Carolyn and Casey with us. Um, hi everybody, my name is Carolyn Sitter. I'm 23 years old and I'm from Thunder Bay, Ontario where I also did my undergrad at Lake University in um, honors biology with neuroscience. Um, I only applied to University of Toronto and I'm actually a re applicant this year and I was fortunate enough to gain acceptance. Um, my hobbies include hunting, fishing, um, and just recently <laughs> spending time with my new puppy who keeps me pretty occupied. Hi everyone, um, welcome. My name is Casey, um, I'm 26, um, I'm from Orange which is about an hour north of Toronto. 
Um, I was accepted to the University of Toronto. Um, it was my first time applying to U of T, but it was my second year applying to PA school in general. Um, some of my hobbies are um, watching sports and playing sports, fitness, health, spending time with family and friends, um, being outdoors. Um, and I also went to the University of Western Ontario. So now that we have introduced ourselves, let's see who's here in the audience. In the registration form, I asked about age, education, if you are new or reapplicant, and which schools you will be applying to. So let's see what that looks like. So 46% of you were between the ages of 20 and 22, with almost 14% between the ages of 20 and 25, as well as 32 and over. 34% of you are currently in your fourth year of undergrad. 24% are done undergrad and working. Almost three quarters of the audience are new applicants. And lastly, 86% and 83% are applying to McMaster and U of T respectively, with 42% applying to U of M. So what is the PA? I'm sure we've all gotten that question many, many times. I know I have. Um, so I asked the students what they respond to that question with, and here are their replies. I won't, I won't read them all, but some key elements that constitute a PA is a physician extender, generalist, lifelong learner, patient-centered care, collaborator, and the list goes on and on. You can pause and read through, uh, read through this at home with the recording. All right, so now we're moving on to the application process and timeline, which I know many of you are, and myself included, are currently going through. Again, just for the sake of time, we will be doing an overview of each university's application requirements, then going through their deadlines. Again, I really want to emphasize that these requirements are specific to the current 2021 and 2022, uh, 2021, 2021 to 2022 application cycle and may change for future cycles. So first is the Master of Physician Assistant Studies. Manitoba is the only university that graduates students with a master's degree. Um, and we will have Dana presenting this. Yes, so these are the um, eligibility requirements for this year's application cycle. So the first requirement is that you are a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident of Canada. Secondly, you need to be a graduate of a four-year bachelor's degree. I will let you know that it doesn't necessarily have to be a science degree. It can be any degree that you are passionate about or anything that you want to learn about. So I think that's something that's very unique about this program, and it does allow the acceptance of many different backgrounds. If um, you did not do your degree from a Canadian or approved country, then you will be doing the English language proficiency test. Looking at the minimum GPA requirements, the minimum to apply for the graduate studies is a 3.0 out of 4.5 in your last 60 credit hours. Going back to not needing to have a science degree, you can do any degree again, but you do need to have the three minimum um, courses. So this is human anatomy, human physiology, and biochemistry. And when I applied, I believe you did need to have a grade of at least a B plus in all of those courses. So no matter what degree you do, you do have to take those classes. You will have to write the CASPER exam and then also complete a CV or a resume, a statement of intent, and then also have two letters of recommendation. So two different references that will like write you letters. And then just the preferred criteria. So the program does prefer uh, students from Manitoba as well as rural residents. A competitive um, GPA for the program is a 3.5 of a 4.5. And the program does um, include psychology and microbiology as absent courses. So they are not necessarily needed, but it will definitely help you once you are accepted into the program and you are a first year student. All right. So um, but before we get to the uh, deadlines and the timeline, we actually got additional tips directly from Ian Jones, who is the MPAS program director. He clarified that although the minimum GPA is 3.0 uh, out of 4.5, previous students have had GPAs greater than 3.5. An academic CV that is less than four pages is recommended. He emphasized the importance of the originality of the statement of intent to make sure you have proofread it and that he recommends getting it reviewed by a critical friend. Also make sure to get the program's name correct so it's not masters, it's master of PA studies. 
In terms of MMI, uh, Ian has confirmed that on-campus MMI will not occur at U of M. Note that programs can change the nature of the questions asked during the MMI. He does not recommend over-rehearsing for MMI as it should be natural and reflective. And when you are responding to questions, ensure you clarify what is being asked, use personal experiences, offer and recognize opposing views, and conclude with the, this is what I would do, Stephen. Lastly, keep responses to four to five minutes when possible. So thank you, Ian, for that. And then Laura will go through the timeline. I do just want to say thank you so much to uh, Alexandra, who runs the Alex Pre-PA account, who created these great infographics for us today. Yeah, so the University of Manitoba's program, the general outline is as followed. Again, as Prada explained, these do vary year to year, um, depending on circumstances, especially with COVID, it was slightly different for our um, admission year. Um, essentially, you write your CASPER exam and have all your supplemental application, CV, resume, and statement of intent is all due, as well as your references by January 15th. Um, MMI interviews, um, the invitations are usually sent out around mid-March. The actual interviews will take place around early to mid-April and acceptances are sent out around mid-May. And then our program started in the very last week of August, but around September is when the program will start. I do just want to preface all these deadlines. They are approximations only. They are not a definitive timeline, just approximations. So next is the McMaster Physician Assistant Education Program that graduates students with a Bachelor of Health Sciences, Health Sciences degree. Selena will be going over the requirements. So in terms of eligibility, you have to be a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident of Canada. Um, as Dana said, if you are not, then you need to take an English language proficiency test. I believe if that's if you didn't do your um, undergraduate degree in Canada or you're not um, a Canadian citizen or permanent resident, uh, you have to have a minimum of two years of an undergraduate degree. So that is 10 credits, I believe. Um, in order to be eligible to apply. The minimum cumulative GPA has to be a 3.0 on the 4.0 scale. So that includes all university courses taken. Um, if you've only completed two years, that would be all the courses you've taken. Um, it does not consider master's levels courses, just undergraduate. Um, and the last um, part would be the Kira Talent interview, which you would do if your GPA requirement was met. Um, just a couple things that I was told from my program um, in terms of statistics, the average of my class um, in terms of GPA was a 3.76. However, if you do have, you know, above or below that, we still encourage anyone that is eligible to apply. So as long as you have that 3.0. And um, a question that commonly comes up too that I thought I would share is on OYAC, there is an activity section. So the PA program does not consider um, any of the activities you write there. So it's not a part of your application. However, McMaster University does require that section just to be completed to be considered for admission. So um, the PA program itself won't look into what you put there, but it does need to be completed for the university. So I can just go through the timeline. So it, was, it feels like forever ago now. <laughs> Um, that we did this, but the application is generally has to be submitted by the 1st of February. So it says on OUAC um, for myself and anybody in the, the Zoom call or Facebook Live here who is currently a student at Mac, that's actually a different application. You don't have to do both. So either the OUAC or like the internal McMaster application, that's by February 1st. And then everybody who, like Selena said, meets that 3.0 will get access to the supplementary application. Um, and that's like mid-February-ish. Um, looks like Prada has February 24th here. Um, and then you do have to submit the supplementary application by March 3rd, um, so very beginning of March. And then MMI invites go out mid-April. Um, so interviews typically around the very beginning of May. And then your acceptances are set out, um, sent out in like mid-May-ish. My class started PA school on August 31st, so it traditionally is um, just that very beginning portion of September, typically a week before most undergrads start.
So lastly uh, is the U of T program. Um, their program is called the Consortium of Physician Assistant Education, sorry, University of Toronto Physician Assistant Program. And that graduates students with a Bachelor of Science degree. Uh, and Casey will present the requirements. All righty. Um, so this is the requirements for 2021 to 2022 cycle. Um, so firstly, you have to be a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident of Canada. Um, and if English isn't your first language, then an English, English language profic proficiency test. Um, you need to have a minimum of four semesters of your undergrad degree. Um, the minimum cumulative GPA is um, a 2.7 um, out of a 4.0. Um, you need a minimum of 100 healthcare hours. Um, and then the supplemental application, which comes out a little bit later on in the year. Um, and you need one reference. Um, the preferred criteria, yeah, I do believe it, I believe Selena's right. I do believe it is a 3.0 this year. And was it a- So it, it's not 3.0 this year, it's 2022, 23. Okay. So okay. this year is still 2.7 out of four and you still like need the reference letter. And then 2022, 23, it's 3.0 out of 4.0. And instead of a reference letter, your reference actually just submits a form and answers questions or something along those lines. Um, yeah. Right, right, okay. Um, and then the preferred criteria is to have a human anatomy and physiology course, um, the healthcare experience within the past five years. Um, and it's preferred to have like direct hands-on patient care um, versus a more indirect role. Um, paid positions are preferred as well. Um, a current resident of Ontario, and also um, it is a plus if you live in the northern regions or rural communities. Okay, so um, I'm going to be doing the timeline. So you submit your, um, you apply for your UAC application, sorry, and like I think it's late September, early October, um, and then that needs to be in by January 18th. And then you get your supplemental application um, and your transcripts, uh, which uh, do go through UAC. Um, and the POELC, if a, uh, um, required, needs to be in by February 1st, as well as your reference letter. Um, and um, the reference also needs to submit um, like a comp competency sheet, I think. Um, if I remember correctly, and that also needs to be submitted by uh, February 1st, and then uh, MMI invites go out mid, mid um, April, and then you do your MMI early May, and then around the end of May application, or sorry, acceptances are sent out. And then um, I also believe that we started August 31st, if that's correct. Yes. Okay, Casey. Yeah. So we also started a week before undergrad started. Sorry to intrude there. <laughs> That's okay. All right. So, so um, sorry, oh. Prada. Do you just want to go to the um, chat? It looks like they may be, there may be some um, questions or like just guidance that needs. There's um, other panelists that are answering. Oh, okay. Perfect. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, guys. <laughs> All right, so, so now that we know what the requirements are and approximately when they are due, let's move into how to prepare for them. So the way this will work is that I have separate, separated the application components by university and will give a brief description of what each of the components are. I have asked the students questions about the application components, such as what books did you use to prepare or how long their documents were, and the students who have been accepted to the university will answer said questions. So we'll start with U of M application components. So one thing that is unique to U of M applications is the completion of the CAS uh, online test called CASPER. CASPER stands for Computer-Based Assessment for Personal Sampling Personal Characteristics. It is a situational judgment admissions test developed by researchers at McMaster, which aims to measure traits such as professionalism, ethics, communication, and empathy. 
Casper is comprised of 12 sections, eight of which are video-based, four of which are word-based scenarios. Each scenario is followed by three questions that you have five minutes to respond to. The questions may or may not be directly related to PAs, but are more about how you react in ethical dilemmas. The test takes from 75 to 90 minutes long to complete, and the difference being an optional 15 minute break in between. If you haven't already, make sure to sign up for your CASPER test as there are only a few dates available, the last being January 5th for this application cycle. So our U of M students include Dana and Laurel. However, Olivia was also accepted into the program, so she will be answering questions as well. So the first question is, did you use preparation books? Dana, you can start. Yeah, so when I first wrote my Casper exam, I did use some books. So the BMO Casper prep book, I found very, very, very insightful. It broke down not only what the test was, but kind of uh, sample questions and how to format answers. Other books that I did use, I read Doing Right. Um, I actually was gifted that book. I don't think it's necessarily essential for Casper. Um, but it did give me a very good um, insight into different ethical dilemmas and kind of how to approach that. So I did find it useful. And then another resource I used was the University of Washington's bioethics page. So um, if you haven't been in school for a while or you never took an ethics class, I found that was very easy. It broke down some very common ethical dilemmas and kind of ways to approach it. So I found that all very helpful for the exam. Laurel? Yeah, so similar to Dana, I also use the BMO books. I use the Casper Prep, and I believe there was an MMI one as well that was similar, and I read them at the around the same time. Uh, and again, I second what Dana says, um, understanding the basics of medical ethics, bioethics is really important. Um, fortunately, I took some medical ethics courses through my nursing degree. So I didn't read, do any additional reading for that, but um, the U of W sounds like a great resource I would, I would suggest. And Olivia. So I wanna preface my preparation being that I am a very type A personality and I'm the type of person that I need to read every book on the planet in order to feel confident moving forward. That being said, I used a lot of resources for both Casper and MMI, but it's not necessary to do all of this depending on your personality type and maybe your experience and how you feel overall heading into this application cycle. But if you are like me and you like to prepare, I found the BMO Casper prep book very helpful specifically for Casper based answers because it is a type um, test compared to the MMI that is more verbal generally. As well, reading Doing Right was also very helpful to get a good framework for the ethical components because similarly, Casper and MMI are basically asking the same types of questions. So if you're going to read Doing Right, you might as well read it before Casper just to get a head start on your MMI prep. The MMI for the Mind, I also read, but found it was very repetitive, the BMO book. So you can probably pick and choose one or the other, MMI for the mind, or the BMO Casper or MMI Prep. Awesome. Next question, did you have a practice schedule? So my schedule, it was very, um, it wasn't specific. I didn't set it out like one day every week. Um, just whenever I had time, I was working full time at the time when I was practicing. So whenever I had a little, a few hours, I would just kind of go over a few questions, um, read through the books kind of at my own pace. And then about a week before the test, I did more practice exams um, and more, more tests up to that. But before that, it wasn't an actual schedule for me. Yeah, I would say similar to Dana. Um, I was still in my nursing program while I was going through the application cycle. So it was a little bit difficult for me to find ample time to prep. Um, so I believe I scheduled mine after my final exams in December. And it was about two weeks uh, into my break that I wrote the exam. So I think I really crammed in the two weeks of practice um, just because that was what my schedule allowed. So my practice schedule was very informal, October, I would say, starting to think about these things, reading books and such. And then I really kicked things up end of December and January, 
probably the most helpful thing for me was closer to the date of Casper was to actually do mock Casper exams that you can find online or make yourself and then go back and reread over your answers or even send your answers to a friend to look over, which really simulates not only the type of questions, but also that anxiety because Casper has such a short time limit that that's definitely a part of the test that you want to prepare for. Did you practice with others? Dana? Yeah, so I just actually want to kind of take a step back. So something that I did last year that I found extremely beneficial is I actually made a group on Facebook and I just called it, I think like pre-PA U of M or something like that. And I had a bunch of students join it. Olivia was actually one of them. That's how we became close last year. Um, but what having this group did was it allowed us to talk about the application process and start working through each segment of the application together. So as a group, we tackled Casper, we tackled the MMIs when it came around. So having that group and having people going through it was so beneficial. So yes, I did practice with others. I practiced with Olivia and a few other people in the group. And what we did was we would kind of just bring up an ethical dilemma, something that might be similar to a Casper exam question, and we would just talk it out. So it was a little bit different talking it out, um, but it was very, very insightful to hear what other people thought. Um, I think a huge thing about PA is we all come from different backgrounds. We all have different life experiences. So the way that we approach these questions is very different. So hearing what Olivia would say to a question versus what I was thinking, it definitely started to expand my horizons. And I actually actually think that helped a lot with Casper because I started to look at different viewpoints. So if you're able to form a group, definitely do it. And another thing we did, we would uh, like put a question in the chat and type like five minutes, type out your answers, and then we would compare. So that kind of made sure we were hitting the points that are definitely essential to hit, but also um, different viewpoints between the members. So if you're able to practice with others, definitely do so. It's very, very helpful. Yeah, I, I guess I didn't find that group. Um, <laughs> no, I think that um, it's really important. I, I didn't find other people to practice with. I guess this isn't a complete answer, but I did practice with um, my husband. I would type out um, my answers and have him read them, which was really helpful because especially in a typed situation, sometimes when you reread what you've written, you realize, oh, that came across in a way that I, I didn't intend. Uh, so for Casper prep, I would strongly suggest practice typing both for speed and to also take the time to review what you've written to ensure that you're coming across in the way that that was intended. Um, further to that, I personally came up with a bit of a format of how I was answering questions. Um, which was really helpful in those high stress situations. You have all of these thoughts running through your head. Um, it's great to have a method of how you want to convey them on paper. So um, the, the books did help with that significantly. Just to reiterate, yes, practicing, I practiced with Dana and found that extremely helpful, but I also from practice groups closer to MMI with Casey as well, who's on the call. So. I found it really helpful to make sure you're having a balanced perspective, because again, if you're practicing by yourself, you think you're answering things right, but then you hear different opinions from different people, and you learn that maybe there are different approaches to answers that are all right, but you want to make sure you're hitting a balanced perspective of all of them. Awesome. So, um, after each application component, there will be a list of relevant pre-asked questions from the audience that our students uh, will answer. So um, Dana, Laurel, and Olivia, if you can answer these two questions. And um, again, I'm just going to remind everyone for panelists, if we can keep answers to one, one minute, just because we have had some technical difficulties. So we do have, have to keep things short. But uh, if you can go ahead and answer. Sure. Can... So... Oh, Olivia, you go. Sorry. <laughs> Um, I can answer the first question since I wrote Casper and then had MMIs at Mac and U of M. So essentially Casper is a type uh, exam that is a situational judgment test versus an MMI. It's typically more verbal answers, but can also have written answers. I would say that they are similar in terms of preparation, but the types of questions are going to vary slightly for each. I found that Casper was more general, more situational versus because the Casper exam is sent out to many different programs versus the MMI was very specific to, for example, medical ethical questions. 
It can also be more vague in terms of communication or even role playing if you are in person. So those are the main differences, but they are similar in terms of your preparation. All right, and then should I have already booked my CASPER test? Um, I'll just go ahead and answer that. Probably yes, um, as I showed earlier on, uh, there are only a couple more spots for a um, couple more dates for the CASPER test to book in order to be eligible for this coming round. So please make sure you go do that as soon as you can. All right, so next thing is the CV resume. So U of M gives an option to use either, either a CV or a resume, but CV tends to be used for grad school and to show education, research, and expertise, while resumes tend to be used for jobs and to highlight work experience and related accomplishments. Ian Jones did say that an academic CV is well received, so keep that in mind. Um, the PDF I linked here is um, gives, it's actually by U of M and it gives great examples of all kinds of CVs such as standard medicine related, so please make sure to check that out. So first question, how many pages did you guys use? Yeah, so mine was four pages. I think Prada mentioned earlier, that's probably the max. Um, again, just use your discretion for any of this. Mine was four pages. I also included certificates. So it actually ended up being a lot more than four pages. Um, but generally just write all the information you think it would need and don't use these as like standards exactly. Um, but I, mine was four pages. Laurel. Yeah, mine was two. Um, it was the same resume I would use for a job application, just slightly tweaked towards um, uh, focusing more on my educational uh, background. Awesome. Olivia? Mine was three. Um, I think initially it was closer to four or five, and I really had to work on condensing it. Um, but yeah, the shorter, the better, because um, admissions committees don't want to read through pages and pages of your CV. For sure. And what headings did you use? Yeah, so mine are just listed there. I talked about my education. I talked about previous employment that I had, volunteering that I have done and I do, extracurricular activities, and also shadowing experiences specific to the University of Manitoba. Yeah, and again, as Dana said, mine are, are highlighted there. Essentially, I just started with a bit of a blurb about me, um, a professional statement, if you will. Um, and then I went into my education certifications and experience. Um, I just chose to reformat mine a little bit, highlighting in the first couple headings what I thought the PA um, admissions committee would want to see. So highlighting my experience as a paramedic and my education as a nurse. And Olivia? So as listed on the slide, I talked about my education. I decided to lump my work and volunteer experiences together because I didn't have a lot of professional uh, work experience. So I just combined those categories. I also listed my professional development, like being a member of Toastmasters, for example, um, publications from my job as a research assistant, select athletic honors, and then presentations that I gave over the past two years. And how many bullet points did you use for each experience? Yeah, so I actually, um, I did paragraphs. I kind of described each experience in more of a paragraph form. So I actually didn't use bullet points. Laurel? Yeah, I was a bit more of a bullet point person. I had about five, roughly, give or take, for each section. But uh, my education and certification section was a little bit more in depth. Yeah, so mine was, sorry, mine was similar to Laurel, um, between three to 10 bullet points, depending on how much information you needed. And did you have an objective statement? Yeah, I just had one right at the beginning. Yeah, I did as well. I did as well. And I do believe that Ian said that, that uh, an objective statement is also well received. So keep that in mind. Uh, Pre-asked questions about CV resume, should I list additional references on my CV or resume? I can take a crack at that one. I don't think it's necessary to list additional references um, because the references are submitted separately and that's actually through the supplemental application online. You'll list your references as well as their email so everything will go through there. Um, so I don't believe it would be necessary to list additional references in my opinion. 
All right, so moving on to the next component. So the statement of intent is a maximum 1,000 word essay that should answer the four questions posted on the right. So this is for, again, the current application cycle. Um, Ian Jones, again, the MPAS program director, stressed the importance of making the personal, the statement personal. Um, using third parties to, uh, to help you write it, it may by backfire. And keep in mind that this statement will be checked for plagiarism. Uh, during the registration, 81% of you said this is where you would like um, the most help in. So let's get started with the questions. So what format did you all use and how many paragraphs did you use for your statement of intent? Yeah, so with my statement of intent, I told a story throughout the entire statement, um, making sure that every single question was answered. So I didn't necessarily split it up question by question. Instead, I kind of just told my story and then made sure it was very clear when I was answering those questions. Yeah, similar to Dana, I think that that's um, what I did as well. I talked about myself and my upbringing and my personal story and I ensured that if I was answering a question that was specific um, per the application page I would you know ensure that I used some of the wording of the question uh, in my response so it was very clear that I was answering all of those questions and um, how many paragraphs yeah as it says there about six including a introduction and closing So I took a little bit of a different approach. I used a complete essay style. So with an introduction, a conclusion, each question was a different paragraph because all of my stories didn't sort of like mesh together to answer the questions perfectly. So I just sort of separated it out. I think it came out to six to eight paragraphs. Why did you pick the PA profession as that is something that is um, kind of a question for the statement of intent? Yeah, so I definitely went into more detail about why I chose PA in my statement than what is listed here. Um, but generally, the impact that PAs can have on patients individually, and I've been able to see how that can impact communities. I am from rural Manitoba. I lived about two hours north of Winnipeg for a few years of my life as well. So I was able to see the introduction of a PA into that community and the positive impact they were able to make. So that had a huge impact on why I chose PA. Also being able to practice medicine in a team-based environment. If you can't tell, I love to talk. I love to meet people. I love building relationships. So that aspect of the profession definitely stood out to me. Um, so building relationships and then advocacy, I think that's a huge part of my life. And I think that's a huge part of the profession. So everything kind of checked off all the boxes for me. Yeah, so I didn't uh, really have any exposure to the PA profession um, before I was in my nursing degree and throughout my clinical rotations. I That's where I was first exposed to PAs working in hospital. Um, I didn't know what they did, so I spent a lot of time talking to them and asking what exactly their role was and how they got into that profession. Um, definitely intrigued me um, as I was always planning to do a master's degree and I think naturally I just thought that I would do the NP stream. Um, but what was a bit of a factor in my decision for PA versus NP was that I am a bit of an older student, I have a family, um, I wanted to be able to complete my education in a timely manner as well. And so being able to enter the PA program right after my nursing degree was uh, a huge benefit for me. Further to that, um, being able to provide high level and uh, interventions to patients, um, more complex high acuity care was also something that has always interested me about being a medical provider. So um, I think that it really balanced my experience as a paramedic in making clinical decisions um, in a very autonomous manner, as well as my nursing experience. Um, the PA profession just seemed like the perfect fit for me. And for me, I have a variety of reasons. The first being that I was a patient in a life-threatening car accident in 2016. And from this experience, I really appreciated the difference of high quality patient-centered care. And that really inspired me to do the same for my patients moving forward and to be part of a profession that takes the time to listen to the patient's concerns. And PA was a big part of that for me. 
Next, working on a team based on my experience in Olympic level windsurfing. I loved working together with other athletes and training partners and to transfer this into the PA profession was a huge reason for me to go into it. Advocating for others, whether that be patients, advocating for the profession or for your own learning opportunities as a physician assistant was another big point, as well as probably the most important point being the sustainable solution to several healthcare crises like physician burnout or healthcare inaccessibility. I am a firm believer in being part of something that creates a positive change in society. And so that's a huge reason I decided to become a physician assistant. All really great reasons. Next question is why did you select or why did you want to apply to y, uh, U of M? Yeah, so I only applied to the University of Manitoba and that's where I gained acceptance. So for me, I was born and raised in Manitoba. I've always lived here. Um, I also did my undergraduate degree at the University of Manitoba. I found the institution to be extremely professional. I had such a great experience in my undergrad there. So it definitely made sense to continue my educational endeavors with the same institution. The faculty itself is so supportive. I was able to tell that before I even gained admission into the program. Um, just going through the application process, everything was streamlined, everyone was so amazing. And small class size, so the program, there's 15 of us within the first like two hours of meeting each other, we became like a little family. Um, so so that was huge for me, just because like at U of M and undergrad, there was like 500 people in the class. And now we're down to 15. We know everybody's life, everyone's stories. And it's just so great to have like 15 other best friends now. Uh, yeah, for me, U of M, um, I was already familiar with the institution. That's where I did my nursing. I currently live in Manitoba, so I didn't really have the option or will to move. Um, you know, I have a family here, so doing a program in a different province just simply wasn't an option for me. Um, but above and beyond that, I really do appreciate the small class size and my new little family and um, being in a master's level degree program um, allows you the opportunity to do a research um, component in where you may have the opportunity to be published at one point. So that was definitely an intriguing factor for me as well. So to reiterate both Dana and Laurel, um, the smallest class size in Canada, as well as the research-based master's degree. And the third point is the spiral curriculum, which I'm sure Dana and Laurel can speak to better than I am because I'm currently at Mac. But my understanding is that at U of M, they start at a basic level foundation and all of these different courses and then build upon it as the year progresses. So that was one of the uh, features that attracted me to U of M. Awesome. I can speak to that, Olivia. It absolutely is a spiral, spiral curriculum. Um, in our first month, we took biochemistry. So we learned a lot about acid and bases um, at kind of a basic level. Now we're in physiology and guess what's back? Acid and bases at a different level. And I'm assuming next semester, it'll just keep building and building. So we're already fully exposed to that, but it's a great way to learn. So if that's something that works for you and you like adding on to that, U of M is definitely uh, very good for that. Awesome. So next question, what community involvement did you discuss? So the community involvement that I kind of touched on, I had volunteer, I still volunteer at a community health clinic in Winnipeg. So just my experiences there, what I've learned, how it shaped me, what it makes me want to do in the future. I also talked about my position being a speaker for a mental health organization called Jack.org. So I was able to kind of discuss what that means to me, why I'm doing that. And then I also discussed my position working at HealthLinks in Busan in Manitoba, um, how amazing of an organization that is, and especially during COVID, what we were able to do. So those were kind of what I discussed, obviously in more detail, but yeah. Um, for me, I focus my community involvement around my work as a paramedic. Um, as I've been working and going to school for the past four years, I didn't really have too much time to volunteer on top of that, but I did spend some time doing some volunteer um, camp nurse positions up at Camp Arnaz. 
um, and I've been doing some medical volunteering here and there throughout the past decade or so at different events and, and whatnot. So yeah, most of my community involvement uh, highlighted my work as um, a rural paramedic in Manitoba, as well as northern regions. So for my community involvement, I tried to pick specific positions where I learned something or developed a skill that would be transferable to the PA profession. So with that being said, I selected a few things such as being a windsurfing coach, a marketing supervisor for a health promotional campaign at Queens, which was a volunteer position, as well as being a research assistant and volunteer at Canadian Blood Services. All right, so now we're gonna, going to get to the pre-asked questions. So again, just due to time, we'll try to briefly touch on these. Um, so first question, how did you relate your work and volunteer experiences to the PA program? So we'll get one person to answer that. Um, I can I can go for that. I think that mine is very relevant. So I mean, maybe I'm not the best person to answer just because um, it yeah, my work and volunteer experience is all medical related. And so luckily, I was able to really link that and my experiences. Um, you know, for example, I, I did talk a lot about my experience with the shortages of physicians in rural Manitoba and the impact that that has on um, patients and healthcare providers and how it's important to highlight how PAs can really be a great solution to fill that gap. So having that background and knowledge of what the PA profession can provide was really helpful. Beautiful. A question we got from audience was, I've heard that it's often good to pick a theme or focus for an application, such uh, i.e. a specific driving force or goal for your pursuit as a PA. Do you think showing a specific interest in one area is better than touching on many areas? I can try to answer this one. So for me, I personally decided to focus on a bunch of areas because I consider myself to be a well-rounded individual and have a lot of different elements that I want to touch upon to present the most, most authentic version of myself in my application. So I would say that it depends on how you want to present yourself, but if you find that picking a theme presents yourself in a way that's most authentic to you, then you should do that. But it all sort of depends on um, what sort of what sort of personality you have and what sort of experiences you bring to the table. And last question we had was for those who had a lower GPA, did you discuss this in your statement of intent? So I can answer this. Um, I'll kind of do more of a spin on it. So I I didn't discuss lower GPA, but something that I think is very important is discuss anything that you think is relevant. If you had a life event or you struggled in your first year and you started doing well or you improved your grades, discuss it, bring it to the table. I think it shows that you can um, grow from from your first year. Um, something that I did discuss was that I was a reapplicant to the program. So I did mention, you know, the differences that I had made or what had changed. So I think in relation to having a lower GPA, you can definitely do the same. If you don't feel like you need to address it, then of course don't use your discretion. But for people that do have a lower GPA, if you want to discuss it and you feel like it is relevant and it shows any strengths that you have gained, then I think it definitely could be worth mentioning in your statement. Awesome. So the next uh, thing is letter of recommendation. So U of M requires two. One must be from a professional, but both have to be from individuals who have current knowledge of your uh, attributes and suitability for medicine. You cannot use family or any extended family members. During the application form, you can input their contact information, which will send the references a link to fill out online. The references you use have an option to also send in a letter, but they do not need to. You can also refer to U of M admissions bulletin for information about letters of rec. So who did you use as a reference? So one thing I want to say, um, I think that people can get caught up on trying to use someone with a high title, feeling like they need to use a professional. Um, for me, I just wanted to use who knew me, who could speak to my attributes, my strengths, and who, 
who knew me best. So I actually worked at a golf course for five years. Um, my manager there knew me very, very well. So I used him as a reference. And then I also was able to work directly in collaboration with a nurse over the last year. So I was able to use her as a reference as well. And they were able to kind of see me in different situations, stressful situations. So they were able to talk to my attributes there and then connect it to why I would make a good PA. Yeah, for me personally, I used uh, the first person I used is my education supervisor from my job as a paramedic. Um, they were very familiar with the PA profession, really um, appreciated and valued the importance of higher level of education. And they even themselves wanted to consider that as a career. So um, I thought that was really important. I think that whoever is chosen really needs to have a good understanding of what a PA is and what kind of personality traits um, are required to, to work in, in the medical field. Um, the other person that I used was my clinical coordinator from my second year nursing placement. Kind of an odd connection there just because we didn't have a lot of direct um, supervision in, in our relationship. However, there was a lot of personal conversations that went through, um, you know, that we discussed about my, my goals in, in applying to the PA program. Um, and I just ended up talking to her quite a lot about, you know, how I was feeling and, and why I was exploring this as a profession. So I feel that she got a lot of feedback from my direct supervisors of how I was doing in my nursing degree, as well as had that personal connection. But I will just say that I think in general, it's really important with your references to whoever you ask, um, schedule a meeting with them to sit down and discuss what a PA is, what, why you want to be a, be a PA, what the application entails, the competitiveness of the program. I feel like that just really helps them, you know, be drawn into the application process with you and almost want you to succeed. Like, oh, it's so crazy competitive. I really want to root for you. And, and that just, it helps. So yeah, I think that's important. So for me, I first got my letter of reference from my uh, manager as a research assistant, who I briefed on what a PA was and sort of what elements they could speak to in their letter. And then my second reference was actually an alternate. So I was planning on getting a reference from my manager when I was a clinical intern at a naturopathic clinic, but she was super busy with COVID related things and declined um, the ability to do so. So I had to kind of scramble and find a backup. So I asked my coach, my strength and conditioning coach, who had known me for three years to write this letter. And it was sort of a wild card, um, but he knew me very well. He knew my work ethic. He could really write a letter from a personal level, which I think played a big part. And I did take time to bring him up to speed on what a PA is, what this program entails, and what to touch upon in the letter. When did you ask for references? So I had been working with both my references. Um, again, I was the reapplicant, so I actually used one of the same references. Um, so they they knew it was coming. We kind of discussed it on and off between October, November, uh, when I was going to finally submit it, so they could do it. Um, so I asked officially in December, and of course it was due January fifteenth. So. I feel like that was hopefully enough time. They knew since about October that it would be coming though. Yeah, I really think it's important to at least have a discussion early on um, and then tell them that you'll keep in touch and that when it gets closer to the application time, what would, they, what would be expected of them? I really wanted to ensure that they had theirs submitted before the Christmas holidays, just because I know that that's a really busy time for people, especially people who are celebrating um, Christmas. And I really didn't want to be bugging them like January 1st about uh, getting that letter in. Um, and I, so I wanted to make sure as well for me, that also means that you need to have your part of the application done before you can, because the reference is uh, the last part of the application. So your whole ha application has to be complete before you can um, send out those invitations for them. I, I, I believe if I'm remembering that correctly. So I think that's important. I'm just going to jump in here because I'm actually doing the U of M application and you can actually put in your references earlier. So I'm still working on my statement of intent and um, other application components, but I have sent out one of my references already um, because it's a link. So you can actually get it sent out earlier. 
just to answer the question, so I asked in October, and I do recommend starting early because, like I said, somebody um, declined for me, and you kind of had to scramble and find a backup. So definitely get onto that if if you haven't. All right. So I did skip one of the questions just due to time, um, but uh, let's go through the pre-asked questions. So for Manitoba references, should one be academic and one professional? I would like to use two professional, but I am scared that it would hurt my chances. Um, I guess I can speak to this. I didn't use an academic reference. Um, I just graduated last year, so we were online with COVID. I didn't really have an opportunity to get to know uh, professors or any academic people in person. I also didn't do research in my undergrad, so that kind of, I didn't um, have any connections to any academic faculty or staff at that time. So I personally used two professional references and I was accepted with those. Awesome. Is it better to have two great references from one place or one from a different place that you don't know as well? I, I mean, haven't I tried it. Oh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, just, and I'm sure you can just jump in as well. Like, I, I think these are kind of difficult questions just in the sense where, again, like we're not on the admissions committee. I think personally, um, it's more beneficial to have two people who could speak to your qualities best. Um, rather than, um, you know, just trying to get diversity um, in, in, mm -hmm. in the reference, uh, references that you use. So whoever knows you best, I feel is more important. And then how would you recommend asking a professor or supervisor for a letter of rec? I could, Olivia would be great to answer this. Sure. So I actually just emailed my um, supervisors asking for a letter because I knew them fairly well that it wasn't necessary to necessarily have a meeting and explain um, this in a formal setting. But that being said, Laurel mentioned she had formal meetings with her supervisors. So I think it really depends on your relationship with them and um, how much information you think you want to share in what format. Awesome. All right. So thank you so much to Dana, Laurel, and Olivia. So that wraps up U of M's application components. We will now move on to McMaster with four current Mac students answering the questions. So other than GPA, the only other component for interviews is Cura Talent. Cura Talent is an online interviewing platform intended to evaluate your leadership potential, verbal and written communication skills, comprehension of key concepts, your, and overall professionalism. The questions are randomly assigned and preparation and response time can vary widely. Uh, preparation time is only given for the video questions. For the text questions, you'll begin typing immediately. The prep time is determined by, by McMaster and it could be 30 seconds or it could be a few minutes. So you'll only know when you start the process. Likewise, response, time is, uh, response times also vary. All right, so first question, how did you prepare and what resources did you use? So Heidi, you can start. All right, so I wrote there that I use no resources. That's not entirely true, but I would just say for the Kira talent, I didn't really have enough time, uh, just the nature of the way that they sent out the what the Kira talent actually was and then the time leading up to it wasn't a lot of time. So I really focused all my energy on just practicing and getting comfortable sitting in front of my computer and feeling natural about it. And I really think the Kira Talent's intent is to just get to know you. Um, so I think that as long as you're confident in yourself and you can articulate that uh, at that time, then that's great. But really, I do suggest uh, knowing why you're going into the PA profession and why McMaster in particular. Um, but other than that, yeah, I just practice. And there is an option on Kira Talent to like do like a practice thing. Um, so I actually did that repeatedly. And even though the questions were just random and not based on what was happening, it, I felt that it did help because I got used to like the platform that we'd be using uh, come time. Yeah, so I can add to that a little bit. Um, actually, when I originally wrote my answer for this, I was kind of grouping the supplementary application and how I prepped for our MMI online. Um, so it's a little bit different than what I've written there, but I would say the biggest thing is similar to what Heidi was saying, just sort of like etiquette with online interviews. It's very, very unnatural, even right now, to look directly at your webcam when you're speaking. 
Um, and I know that sounds super weird, but so for me, I actually did like a little sticky note that's just like a smiley face. And I like stuck it beside my webcam while I was practicing so that I would actually look at it when I was speaking. Um, and that helped a lot, like, because whenever you get stressed and flustered, I have a fun tendency where I look up. Um, and so it's easier to have something distracting you towards the camera than away. Um, the next thing I did though was introspection. I'm very, very bad at like journaling my thoughts. And so I had to force myself to sort of keep track of what I wanted to convey in the supplementary application, because at the end of the day, it's very short, the amount of time they're actually going to see you speaking. And so I think you need to be intentional thinking to yourself, if they don't take anything else away from this, what do I want them to remember about me? And I think if you consciously write that somewhere and you've repeatedly kind of revisit that, it comes across better. Um, so that was another thing I did. But the MMI specifically, not so much for the, the supplementary application. I actually went through the CanMeds criteria, which is um, just online. You can literally Google CanMeds PA um, and it comes up with all these different competencies. So some of the things we showed on the, the first, like what is a PA slide? Um, and then I just sort of went through my answers. Um, I answered the question, obviously can't disclose what the questions were, but, and then I would sort of tie it to a quality about myself with an example of how I would have displayed X situation, um, how I would have displayed that quality. And then just like making sure you always answer your questions, obviously answer the question they're asking, but then bring it back to, and why would this make me a good PA? Because sometimes the questions won't explicitly ask you about the PA profession. And I think it's your job to still bring that back to that point. So that was like the biggest thing I would say. So similar resources for Cure Talent as the Casper and MMI, but one book I will mention is Savannah Perry's PA Interview Guide. Alternatively, you can also just look on the internet for interview bank questions, because I found that there is no way you can prepare for every question for the Kira Talent, because you're inevitably going to get something you haven't prepared for. But by going through these practice questions, you kind of get into the rhythm of things that you would say or experiences you might talk about. So then when you actually get into the interview, it comes faster to your mind. So I would definitely suggest that resource or um, just Googling exam banks. Another thing that's helpful is practicing yourself, recording on a webcam to make sure that, again, as Jamin said, looking at the camera, maybe you want to use some body language and cutting out those filler words like, like um, uh, because those can be a little bit distracting for the assessors. Okay, so similar to um, my classmates, I used basically all the same resources as them. I also used the Canadian PA blog and um, the YouTube run by Anne, who's here on the call. Um, amazing. She has a lot of interviews about how people went through the care talent process and their application process, as well as a lot of information on the PA profession in general. Um, in terms of preparation, I basically did the same thing as my classmates. Um, I practiced recording in front of a camera a lot just because it is very hard and very unnatural to just look into a camera. It's obviously easier with a face, but when it's virtual, that's just something you have to adjust to. Um, something I also will say is that it's really important to, if you're gonna make a claim about yourself, or for example, saying, I'm a good leader, make sure you can back that up, have experiences that you can use to prove your point. And also just bringing it back to the PA profession is something that's really important that Jamin also mentioned. So that's what I did. Um, Cure talent is stressful, I won't lie, but um, you can all get through it. It's, it's a good experience. Next question is, did you practice with others? Um, so for the Kira talent, I did not practice with anyone. At that point, I think I just would have gotten in my head if I talked to other people and I knew that like this was kind of the first step and it was about me. So I didn't want to really branch off too much. Um, but for the MMI, again, I didn't practice with other pre-PAs or PA students, but I, I tried to talk to friends and family um, about how they would approach certain questions so I could kind of broaden my horizons and see different perspectives. Um, so that's what I did. Yeah, to add to that, I didn't actually practice too much with like the time constraints, um, recording myself. I absolutely never watched back a recording of what I was saying, to be honest, <laughs> with you, because that was super daunting. Um, but what I did do was actually, I called a couple of my friends who like were and were not applying just different perspectives. Um, and basically instead of recording 
um, with time constraints, I actually just brought up a topic that I wanted to talk about um, and just had open conversations with different people about those topics. So for instance, one of my best friends in undergrad was in health and society. So she had lots of information on health inequities um, and different things like that. So for instance, one time I would talk to her about like access to drinking water and we would just have like, you know, like a 10 minute long conversation so that I could learn some things from her and then sort of bounce my ideas off and see like what was and was not um, like basically uncharted territory to me because you want to make sure you're comfortable talking about hard topics because things will come off differently if you aren't sure of yourself. I would say I mostly practiced by myself in my webcam and I did rewatch my videos, which was excruciating but necessary for feedback purposes. Um, I also practiced a lot with my mom during this time because I wanted to make sure my answers were coming across as authentic. And I wasn't saying things that I thought the interviewers wanted to hear, but rather I was saying things that were true and most accurate to my life experience. So I would suggest if you're unsure of an answer, run it by like a close family member or a friend to make sure that those answers are really coming across as genuine. So for myself, I did practice a lot by myself, um, recording myself in my webcam. I did rewatch the videos and that, that's where I kind of picked up on the things that I didn't like that I was doing. Um, you know, those ums, ahs, filler words, looking up or to the side. So um, that was really important. I also practiced with another pre-PA, her name's Nuha, she's awesome. Um, and she was so brutally honest with me, which was something that I really appreciated just because like, I felt as if I was practicing with like my mom or my sister, they'd be like, oh my gosh, you're great. Like, awesome. Whereas it was really beneficial to also practice with another pre-PA that would say like, no, I don't think you should, you know, come across this way or do this or that, or your mannerism. So that's something that was really beneficial to me. I think it's great if um, any pre-PAs have like a group chat or just to connect with other pre-PAs and practice that way. That was something that really helped me. Did you have a practice schedule? Again, for Kira Talent, I felt like they really told us like not very far in advance. So there wasn't really a big opportunity to practice. So for the Kira Talent, I just practiced like a few hours uh, the days before. I honestly, the, the more I practice, the more nervous I get. So I, I just kind of just wanted to just be like, okay, I'm just going to do it. Whatever happens, happens. Um, and then for the MMI, I definitely practiced every day. Once I knew I had an interview, I just practiced every day, worked on uh, questions and just trying to get comfortable talking in front of my computer. Yeah, so similar to Heidi, I did practice, but not too, too much, to be honest. I'm way more of a conceptual person when it comes to interviews. So I did a lot more prep on the written side of things. And by that, I mean, I kind of went through my resume, revisited specific instances and figured out how those would apply to specific questions that I may or may not get. And then the different topics that were important to the PA role. So I spent a lot of time just sort of revisiting and making myself familiar with the things I wanted to talk about um, and then trying to figure out how I wanted to talk about them. So again, I'm going to preface my experience with I over prepare for everything, including Cure Talent and Casper, but I definitely did have a practice schedule and a lot of these assessments overlapped in the, in the way that I was preparing. But I would say that in general, the frequency of my practice was definitely increasing the closer I got to the assessment. So probably a week or two weeks before Cura, I was practicing every day, probably, you know, like five to 10 questions over a period of an hour. Yeah, I would say that I'm similar to you, Olivia. I was so nervous for this application cycle that I was like, I need to start so early or I'm going to crack under, you know, the pressure, the nerves. So um, I started about a month prior. I did read all of those books and went through all those resources kind of like the summer, even before applying. Um, but yeah, in terms of like actually practicing questions, I started about four weeks prior. I would say maybe just like even like you know, 20, 30 minutes a day, um, just to help with that comfort and ease those nerves. Um, when it was coming closer to the interview, I probably did like a few hours every day. Um, so it all depends on your comfort level and how, you know, you can handle the stress and anxieties. I personally thought I was really bad at that. So that's why I took a little bit longer to prepare. All right. So there weren't a lot of questions about Cura Talent. Uh, the questions that were asked were about how to prepare, which you guys answered. So thank you for that. Um, because McMaster uh, 
doesn't really have any other components, uh, GPA questions will be um, directed to our four Mac students. So um, go ahead. So, or, so, so the first question is, what are some suggestions for applicants that don't meet the competitive GPA? And many questions were kind of similar to that. So if you can just speak to how to make yourself a competitive applicant if you don't have a competitive GPA. I don't, oh, Jaden, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I'll start with this by saying, obviously GPA wasn't the standout component for Mac in general, to my knowledge. We aren't told anything about the algorithm, so to speak. Um, but if I had to guess, I would say, probably with a lot of the other applications as well, it's a lot more about who you are as a person than that number on the piece of paper. And I think that everybody can agree. Um, one of the biggest things I actually took away from starting PA school, which seems far-fetched, but it does bring it back to this, I promise, um, mm -hmm. is that when you meet people in this program, it's very, very obvious that everybody is very different, but gets along very well. And I think that's attributable to um, similar qualities in us and the things that we sort of value out of life. And I think that those things are far more important than GPA to convey. Um, and so I would suggest one way that you could compensate if you will but even apart from a poor GPA is just like being able to talk to who you are and like to sort of explain why you do things and sort of be intentional about what you're sharing so really being self-aware I think is like the best thing that you could do in, in this application process at all. Yeah I agree with you Jamin that was a great answer. Um, so yeah, in terms of GPA, I mean, as long as you meet the minimum, I would encourage people to apply. Um, I think, like you said, there's kind of like, um, if any of you have worked in healthcare, there's that like healthcare personality. Um, and I can see it like so clearly in all of my classmates. It's just um, in your answers, I mean, for Cure Talent, don't let the nerves get to you. Um, try your best to show who you are and why you would be a great asset to this profession. Um, that's something that I would focus on because GPA, yes, you could go back and retake courses, but I think something that's more important is reflecting on who you are and being able to demonstrate that and why you would be a great fit for this profession. Sorry, and something else I'll just quickly, quickly add to this is confidence, like which goes along with self-awareness. But I think, and I say this time and time again, when I talk to pre-PAs, if you're fence sitting about whether or not you want to apply for PA, my answer is that I think you need to be more sure before you apply, because it's very, very apparent in an answer if somebody is committed to the profession. Um, and I think that goes a long way. All right. So just due to time, I'm going to go over to the uh, U of T's components now. Um, so we will have current U of T students, Carolyn and Casey, answering questions, as well as Selena, who was accepted to both Mac and U of T. So U of T only requires one reference for this application cycle, which you need to have uh, known for at least three months. This reference has to be from someone who has knowledge of your performance as a healthcare provider and can provide um, and can answer statements about your character, clinical abilities, et cetera. Uh, there are more requirements for the reference, so please refer to U of, uh, U of T's program website. Um, it is to note that it, this isn't a letter of recommendation, but it's a, it's a link. It's a, um, your references will be sent a link to complete the applicant reference form, but it's still very important to make sure they, your reference does get it in online, uh, in time, sorry. So who did you use as a reference? Um, so I used my manager um, at Life Labs where I was um, a phlebotomist there. So I knew her for about two years and I picked her because uh, prior to her being a manager, she was also my colleague and she trained me, which I thought was pretty, um, uh, pretty interesting because she can comment on my work capability as well as my personal capability and personal experience as well. Um, I used one of my supervisors at um, my current job. I worked for people with intellectual disabilities um, and she had been with the organization for about 20 years. Um, and she worked with me in, I worked in group homes and she worked with me in the homes so she could see me interacting with the residences. And um, I felt that she could speak upon my, uh, my clinical skills as well as like my um, 
my like personal skills as well. So I thought she was a good person to ask. So for myself, I kind of have a little bit of a different take on this. So um, because I worked as a medical attendant or um, for like a patient transfer company, I don't work under direct supervision. So um, I didn't want to put a supervisor or a manager because they're not on the road with me. They don't see me in the hospitals interacting with my patients. So I chose a coworker that I worked with quite frequently for three years um, at two different companies. So um, I felt as though he could best um, vouch for me and speak on how I am with patients and my character. So that's why I chose a coworker. However, I think it is preferred to choose a supervisor if you can, but if you don't work under direct supervision, then you can put a coworker, which was my situation. When did you ask for your reference? Um, I personally asked as soon as possible just to get her, um, just so that she was aware. And then like um, Laurel said, I kind of gave her a deadline because I really wanted to be in before the holidays. So I really asked her if she could have it done prior to um, like Christmas. I asked, I would say I asked lightly before November, but I really asked um, her in November and I sat down and kind of told her um, what I needed her to do. And um, we discussed it a little further in November. So for myself, I also asked in November, but I kind of had brought it up um, previously. I would say, you know, ask as early as possible because people need to take that time to reflect and actually think, okay, why would this person be a great PA? How have they um, showed all of these strengths that they're going to talk about? And, you know, people have busy lives. Um, the person that I asked is a paramedic now, so um, I knew he'd be super bu busy. So I just thought to ask um, as soon as I could. And I also wanted mine in before Christmas. So pre-asked questions about references. So what are your recommendations for references for U of T? How did you choose your reference and what do you think is the best source for a reference? So maybe we can have someone, those are similar questions. So if we can have someone answer that. Um, I can go. I think um, for like, how do you choose your reference? I think it's important. Um, I say time and time again, that you pick a reference that can speak on you personally rather than professionally. I think um, it's better to be like for your reference to speak that way so that they're not just saying like, oh yes, like Carolyn is good at dealing with patients or Carolyn is good at uh, time management, but you want somebody who can really speak to um, and like say an example as to why you're good at these things and really dive deep into that. So the admission committee can really understand who you are and what type of person you are and, and how it could be um, attributed to you being a good PA. Is, so the next question is, is a reference from outside Canada accepted? I'm not too sure if you students, if you know that the answer. I don't know. I'm not quite sure. I, I don't think I read anywhere that it wasn't accepted, but I would probably email the admissions, but unless any of you guys know. Yeah, no, I agree. Either I would also email the admissions committee just to make sure. Yeah. Awesome. So healthcare hours, um, they are only required by U of T. Uh, and some of, some of you may know that in previous cycles, 910 hours were, were required, but given the COVID-19 pandemic, securing healthcare, uh, healthcare roles has been really difficult, which is why the program has reduced the minimum number of hours to 100. Uh, again, I wanna preface, this is just for this application cycle. This may change next time for the next cycle. You do need at least two healthcare experiences, which can be obtained through employment, clinical placements, or volunteer. There are more requirements, um, so please refer to their website for all that information. So, Carolyn, um, where did you get your healthcare hours from? So, um, my two, uh, first, I worked at Life Labs as a mobile phlebotomist, and what that intakes is I traveled to patient homes, to long-term care facilities, and to correctional facilities, and I drew blood and um, I performed ECGs, and then I worked as a war clerk in the hospital on a surgical floor, so basically I was processing patient charts and inputting, um, like, blood work or, like, um, procedures into the computer and helping the nurses as much as I could. 
um, for my role. So I worked in group homes um, for people with disabilities. Um, and I pretty much helped with their activities of daily living. I dealt with a lot of medications. I also was on a clinical care team for one of the gentlemen who lived there. Um, so I had a lot of um, interprofessional collaboration. I worked really closely um, with a nurse, um, with a physician and with multiple other um, healthcare practitioners. Um, and for that job, I, only had to have my undergrad degree. I didn't have to have any other um, um, any other requirements. Um, and then my next role, I worked as a physiotherapy assistant um, at a long-term care home for about 130 of my hours. Um, another thing I would like to mention is that I've had a few questions about people who've had who have more than um, two healthcare experiences because you only can speak on two. Um, and like deciding which one they should include and which one they shouldn't. Um, in my personal opinion, I think you should include the ones that you can speak um, the most about and the ones that you've gained most value from. Um, and that I guess would be more relevant to the program. Okay, so um, just I was just looking at the chat. I believe if you only have one experience, you can just put one. I remember on my application, it said like, did you have another experience? And then you could go and add another. But I believe for myself and my experience, two is the maximum. In the past, it was more. So I'm not sure what it's going to be like this year. Um, but in terms of my healthcare hours, I had about um, 1,250 as a medical attendant. So basically what I did in that role was um, I worked with a variety of different healthcare professionals. I was basically transferring patients from different departments of different healthcare facilities, whether that was hospitals, long-term cares, um, to their homes, appointments, um, wherever they needed to go. So um, it's basically like I was working um, in a patient transfer ambulance, just not emergent cases like EMS or paramedics would do. So um, that was direct patient care and that was a paid position. Um, and I felt as though I got a lot of really good experience from that just because I really got to work in an interdisciplinary healthcare team. Um, my second experience was as a field research assistant for a study at McMaster. It's called the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. So that was an indirect experience. So in that um, role, I was just calling participants and doing COVID questionnaires and surveys for a COVID-19 antibody um, testing studies. So we would send them kits in the mail and they would do an antibody test. So those were my experiences. Um, like Casey was saying, for myself personally, I had more experiences, but I kind of chose the two that I felt were most diverse and could show different parts of my personality. So my field research assistant was more public health related and my medical attendant was more clinical. So that's kind of why I chose um, those positions. Um, and were they paid or volunteer? Um, so I'll just, everyone answered the same. So both positions for all three of our students were paid, um, but again, volunteer does count. But, and if anyone wants to just add in anything they want, um, um, you can move on. Yeah. I'll just add in really quick that volunteer and research, um, like Selena's um, re field research assistant is uh, considered as well. We can't really speak to whether the admissions committee will recognize like all of the different types of experience, whether it be paid volunteer or research. Um, and even on their website, it says that they cannot disclose that either just for questions in the, in the chat there. Yeah, and something else I've also been asked a few times about um, shadowing. I don't believe shadowing is counted. I could be wrong, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think it has to be either volunteer or a paid position. Um, so that's just something else to think about. Um, shadowing's great, but I don't think, like shadowing would be great to get exposure to what PAs do and to really determine if you want to, you know, um, pursue a career in this profession, but I don't think it's required for admissions or considered. To quickly add to what Selena said, um, you can talk about like shadowing and stuff on like your supplemental application if there's um, room for it. So even though you can't put it down as healthcare experience, you can still speak to it. Awesome. So we did have um, many questions with uh, in regards to healthcare hours. 
Um, so maybe if we could just do a students, if you could do a quick run through them and um, so that we can kind of get through the information. So something I will say, I'm just kind of reading the questions here. Um, I think as long for the third question there, um, I think as long as you have over the 100, you're good to apply. Um, that's something that I kind of stress. If you meet the requirement, there's no harm in applying and just going through the process and seeing who knows, maybe it'll work out, right? So um, I know I spoke to someone at U of T that got in with just over the minimum requirement. So I don't think it's like, you know, you need over a thousand or 2000 hours to gain acceptance. I think it's more how you can speak on those experiences and also the other parts of your application. Yeah, and you, you kind of speak to the first question as well. Um, it's really about making your other, if you're, if you don't have healthcare hours, you make other experiences more important. Um, do you guys have any suggestions for people who don't have any training and how to get started with healthcare hours? So I can speak to this one. Um, so I didn't have any training when I applied to Life Labs for Phlebotomist. They actually trained me there um, and I applied many, many times. So it does take some time, but I would just really, really reinforce, like keep applying, keep putting your name out there. Like it's gonna keep coming across. Um, same thing for like the work work at the hospital. I think when I did my, or submitted my resume, I applied to like 13 other jobs at the hospital too. Just really trying to get some experience. Awesome. So this is the last component we will discuss today, which is the supplemental application. In previous cycles, you would list your healthcare experiences and then answer questions uh, that are similar to a personal statement. In these previous cycles, there was a maximum word limit of 250 or a maximum character limit of 1,500. Um, applicants only receive the link to fill out this supplemental application form after they submit their OUAP form. Um, so since this document isn't available to the general public, the ap application can vary from what I just said. So I would advise you to go to the program, program website to learn more. But in general, how, how, what would you guys suggest to be concise in, in, in a word limit? So I started mine right away um, and I read through it and read through it and read through it and rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it. And I just really tried to um, make it as concise as possible, like, but then still trying to get my point across. Um, get somebody else to read it. I got other PAs to read it. I got my mom to read it. I got teachers to read it. Um, just any, anything that you can. I also just want to point out that, um, not to frighten anybody, but when I went to submit it, um, really focus on that character. Um, maximum because I do believe it counts like spaces or something like that because I had to reduce mine so just really keep in mind um, that uh, character and word limit. Um, it was kind of similar for me I just um, and I have a hard time being concise um, so I wrote out my answers multiple times. Um, I got multiple people to look over for look over it and um, just make sure it was uh, flowing well. And just um, a lot of the people who I sent it to had a lot of, or had some ideas on it, like how do you shorten it and like better words to use to make it more concise. Um, I also, yeah, that's pretty much what I did. So for myself, what I did first is I kind of wrote out a rough draft. I will admit, I probably went through like 40 drafts. I'm not even joking. Some questions took longer than others, but um, yeah, I thought it was 250 words. And then I kind of like just went to go put it into the SUP app and it cut me off like three quarters of the way through. Um, I emailed the program and it does, for my experience, it did go by characters. Maybe they changed that this year, but um, my answers were probably around like 220 to 230. Cause I think it, they consider... 250 words as if every word was five characters. So um, just be cognizant of that. Um, I think it, from my experience, it was 1500 characters. Um, so, you know, it's very important to be concise and kind of get to the point. Um, you know, big fancy words are great, but it's, I would rather use more concise words and get more um, information that, or points that could prove that I would be a great PA in rather than using those big words. Um, so like I said, just get your point across in an articulate way. Do you have experience with rural northern underserved communities? 
So I live in Thunder Bay, which is um, definitely in Northwestern Ontario. Um, so the hospital here, we actually service, like I said, there was like a large catchment area. So I think we service like from the Manitoba border all the way up to um, like, what lake is that? Lake, lake all the way up to like the top of um, <laughs> Ontario. And then just like um, before, like where, like at Sudbury or Timmins or something like that. So it's huge. So every like big case, um, if it doesn't have to go to Toronto, it actually comes to Thunder Bay. So we see lots of underserved, underserved communities um, uh, and people that come here or yeah, to Thunder Bay. And they, it's really just like a culture shock. Like lots of them don't even have street lights or drinking water. So I really focus on that a lot in my application because I do see it on a daily basis. Um, so I didn't have experience working in these communities. However, I have spent every summer since I was little up in Northern Ontario. Um, and my grandparents used to live there and they actually had, um, there was multiple times where they had troubles ac accessing um, healthcare. So I did speak a bit about that on my uh, supplemental application. So for myself, um, when I was working as a medical attendant, there were um, various amount of times where I would be transferring patients from urban centers, so either Hamilton or Toronto, back to these northern or rural communities. And um, through that experience, I was able to really see these health inequities that people in these communities are facing. So that brought a lot of awareness to um, the health inequities for myself. I also did pursue a Master of Public Health degree. So a large part of that program was learning about these inequities and how to help narrow this health gap. So I did learn a lot about that in those courses as well. Last question. What are, in your opinions, the pros and cons of the distance and uh, distributed delivery method U of T uses? Um, I'll go first. And sorry, Prada, I just want to add to the supplemental application that Anne, um, yeah. if you're part of her email list, she sends out um, many helpful emails. And within that, when the supplemental application comes, you can also um, get her and her colleagues to review it. Um, since I was a reapplicant, I definitely took that advantage, advantage sorry, um, and I did use that. So just to put that out there. Um, but pros and cons. So pros, I only applied to U of T because I absolutely loved like being in my safe zone. I'm very homebody, especially because like um, University of Toronto or like McMaster or something like that, that's super far for me. And I, and I love my little home. Um, and I love being uh, able to do it at your own pace. And when you're able to, I like doing it at night better than during the day. So um, those are really big pros for me. Then cons, of course, you do have to sometimes teach yourself. Um, and if you don't understand something, like it may be difficult, but you really do have your colleagues to help you or your classmates. And then you also don't get to see your classmates as often, which does um, kind of suck. But. Um, so mine's very similar to uh, Carolyn's. Um, so the pros are the flexibility, um, also the traditional learning and um, problem-based learning mix. Um, the cons is, yeah, there's, um, we do have synchronous classes, but we do have asynchronous classes as well. So sometimes it's a little hard to um, stay motivated. However, <laughs> I found it super beneficial to kind of, I'll plan out my week and then the night before I'll review what I'm going to do for the next day. Um, so that's been good as well. Um, it also, yeah, um, we did have our um, campus block, which was super nice to see it, our classmates and everything, but it does um, suck that I'm not around my classmates all the time. So for myself, um, personally, the cons did outweigh the pros, unfortunately, but I would say the pros of um, distance learning is, you know, you do get to live with your support system um, and you get to learn in the comfort of your own home, which was something that I thought was awesome. But Unfortunately for myself, the cons were just having that social isolation from your classmates. I feel that like for myself at Mac, we're kind of all in this together. We see each other and it's a lot more comforting where unfortunately at U of T, you know, you can still contact your classmates, but you don't get to see them as much in person. Um, in terms of the res blocks, I was more a fan of how McMaster has weekly in-person sessions rather than res blocks. And Personally, I'm just not the biggest fan of online lectures. Um, I find it hard to stay focused for whatever reason. I'd kind of rather just go in person and learn where I'm kind of forced to um, stay on track and stay focused. And um, 
for myself, I was kind of just over the lecture style and I wanted to learn something new and adjust to a new way of studying, which is why I was drawn to McMaster's PBL style of learning. Sorry, sorry to do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, that wraps up, that concludes the specific application components for each university. So thank you everyone who uh, are panelists. So thank you so much for all that. Uh, we will move on to the question and answer period. Uh, we only have a very limited time, um, but I do have a really cool surprise if some of you don't know, but today, not only do we have uh, first year PA students answering questions, we also have three lovely practicing PAs who have come to join our students to answer your questions about the PA profession and how it is to be a working PA in Canada. So um, we'll just get started. And so, um, Sorry, I'll let me introduce. So it's Carmen and, and Doris who are our practicing PAs today and they'll be uh, taking turns to answer questions. So if you can kind of introduce yourselves, um, how long it's been since you went to PA school, what your specialty you're in, et cetera. Can go first. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Hi everyone, my name is Doris Hansen. Um, I am in plastic surgery here in Toronto at the Toronto Cosmetic Institute. Um, and I work with four plastic surgeons. Um, I've been a PA now going on 10 years, coming in May. I graduated from a US program in Staten Island, New York. I'm originally from there, um, Wagner College. And it was a five year master's program. So it was like two years undergrad and then three years uh, PA school. I can go next. Uh, my name is Carmen. I am a physician assistant working in Manitoba. I went to U of M uh, for my PA schooling. Um, and currently I'm working in emergency medicine here. Um, am I going through all these questions here, Prada? Yeah, you, you can you can describe uh, who you interact with as well as your kind of a summary of what your work day looks like. Sure. So working in emergency medicine, I'm working right beside docs all day long. I am a year into my practice. So I graduated in 2020. So I'm still reviewing all my patients with my supervising physician, depending on what I'm seeing kind of varies on how in depth that conversation goes with. I work very closely with nurses. We have pharmacists. PT, OT, respiratory therapist. We do have NPs there. However, I don't interact with them too much. Um, typical work day. So my schedule is kind of all over the place, um, working days and evenings. Um, and it's basically just seeing patients all day long and emerge, which I love. And it's, it's great. So I, I'm primarily in the operating room. So I'm usually first assisting in the operating room. Um, I work alongside nurses, um, the OR nurse, uh, anesthesiologists, and the plastic surgeons, of course. Um, we don't have a nurse practitioner in our uh, practice. Um, so a lot of the nurses do the consultations and the follow-ups as well, um, alongside the surgeon. Um, yeah, I help set up the OR and I scrub in and that's mostly my day. I don't actually um, have to write prescriptions or write any notes. So it's a dream dream job for most, not writing any notes or billing, um, which is kind of nice. And I'm a physician assistant working in orthopedic surgery. I um, have been working in ortho for just over 10 years now. Graduated from McMaster back in class of 2011. And um, I've always been an ortho, but the first eight years I worked with, specifically with an orthopedic uh, upper extremity and sports medicine surgeon. Um, and then I started working at a Toronto hospital last year where I now have nine different um, supervising positions. So we work in various specialties, including ankle and foot, hip and knee, arthroplasty, shoulder and upper extremity, occasionally ortho spine. And then I will actually occasionally assist in ortho hand and plastics as well, depending on what the needs are. Um, the PAs have a very expanded scope of practice there, so we just go where they need us. Sometimes it's assisting in the OR, other times it's in clinic. I do occasional inpatient ward management. Um, I've volunteered to do call a few times just for learning purposes, but that isn't actually a part of my regular part of my job. Um, and it's, it's neat because each day is different. Um, I also interact with lots of different healthcare providers. So apart from the orthopedic surgeons, um, in the operating room, we're working with OR nurses, OR attendants, anesthesia, anesthesia assistants, 
um, in the fracture clinic, we're working with ortho techs, advanced practice physios, nurses, RNs, and RPNs. Um, and then we also have nurse practitioners that we occasionally work with. Um, so it's very interprofessional and it's, it's really neat to be able to see all these uh, healthcare providers working together. And then my typical workday is so lovely. It usually begins at 8 a.m. and ends at 5 p.m. No overnights, no weekends, no call. Um, and it's 40 hours a week and I get all this variety. So it's definitely a dream job for me. Um, I can start off with the, is it possible to go to PA school in Canada and work in the U.S. Um, or do undergrad in the U.S.? school so I think there's some so right now there is no reciprocity for PA graduates um, in Canada to practice in the U.S. Um, and it's P, so I'm a U.S. graduate and I can practice here um, without you know taking an exam um, but I still have to maintain my certification and my CMEs in the states of course um, but I think recently there was some sort of um, education law or some sort of executive order that Maine state um, PAs in any, even in Canada under good licensure to be able to practice in New York state. So that's like the recent word. I think it came out like a few weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I don't know that much about it, but that's pretty positive. Um, hopefully we don't steal all the PAs from, from Canada as we have with the nurses. <laughs> and then a question is, what are the biggest challenges you face as a PA? And is it namely limited medical directives? prior to regulation? I'm not sure about the medical directives prior to regulation because in Manitoba, we are regulated. So we don't face that issue. I would say being a new grad working in emergency medicine, some of the, it's a huge learning curve. And since it's super fast paced and emerge, um, some of the biggest challenges personally that I face are, um, I guess, being able to get as much um, supervision as I would have initially liked when I first started out. It's something you learn to work around um, and grab attention where you can, but going into a specialty like that, um, I guess it, it's, it's hard to jump from the classroom right into working. So that's something I was working through my first year, at least in Emerge. I can probably uh, speak to that as well. I would say for new grads, it's about six months to a year to start feeling like you're really good at your job. And it also depends on the specialty. So with ortho, it took me about six months to feel really confident. Um, as a new grad, when I started in physical medicine and rehabilitation, it took me a year <laughs> to feel confident. Uh, physiatry is a lot like internal medicine and the FMSK. So it depends on the nuances and complexity of the specialty you are going into. Um, with regards to international reciprocity, um, when I was former VP of the Canadian Association of Physician Assistants, I went down to the American Association and spoke to uh, people on the PAEA committee, as well as um, other Americans. And basically, the biggest issue with getting Canadian PAs over to the States um, is that uh, in order to challenge the PA certification exam in America, you have to attend a PA school that is physically located in the United States. They all go through a very specific accreditation process. And right now, I think with the resources and money, just trying to grow the profession here in Canada, um, I don't see Canadian PA programs dedicating resources, time, money, energy, and manpower into potentially losing candidates um, when we're trying so hard to build a profession here in Canada. So brain drain is a real thing. We lose very talented healthcare providers like nurses and doctors over to the States because of the job market or whatever other reasons. So um, if you want to work in the States and you've been trained as a PA in Canada, the only way, and I've only known one person to actually do this, is to redo PA school in the United States. Um, and I did provide it, uh, a reference for that PA that ended up doing that, um, but they're on track to, uh, even though they've done, they've worked as a PA um, in Ontario, uh, they were able to uh, get into PA school in the States and do it over again. It's unfortunate, um, tuition's a lot more, uh, but you end up being able to make your money back and I think paying that off. Then I think it was because her partner had moved to the States. Um, so it was sort of more of that circumstance there. Um, and the New York uh, executive order um, is about for 30 days, I think, uh, for Canadians to be allowed to work in the state of New York because they have a severe shortage of healthcare providers right now. Um, I think also uh, in terms of biggest challenges is that uh, you have to advocate as a, as a PA. I, I don't think there's a week that goes by that I'm not explaining to someone, a patient, 
a fellow staff member of what I'm able to do. So it's something that, you know, can be frustrating at times, but it's also patient education and PA advocacy. So if you don't mind having that conversation, you get really good at your PA elevator pitch. We can't sign off our narcotics here in Ontario. So basically, usually what I do is I write up the prescription and the physician will co-sign uh, or sign it. So that's usually how we get over that obstacle. Um, I don't know if Carmen and Doris want to add anything else to add. Um, along with the challenges as a PA, um, it's not just the regulation, although that does play, I think, a big role um, as far as like autonomy here in Canada. Um, I think it's like, yeah, getting the word out what a PA is um, and then like finding appropriate funding that, that's long lasting here or, or even if someone hears about us kind of um, new physicians that want to um, try out having a PA it's when they come to funding. Um, there's a little bit of a pause there. So um, I think I think there's definitely room to grow for sure in that. Absolutely. I definitely have that conversation a lot with doctors that are so interested in PA, but they just don't know how to pay for it. Um, so in the state, uh, PAs can bill. Um, anytime a PA renders a service, um, they're able to bill insurance companies directly. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Doris. Uh, so, so hiring a PA, um, a, PA sal a PA can generate uh, more money than what costs a practice. So it's a no-brainer to hire a PA. In Canada, in a universal healthcare system, it's a little bit of a different challenge because PAs can't bill for services, uh, only physicians can, um, even if you delegate that service to a PA. So there's still challenges and rules around how that works in the OHIP system. Um, and in addition to that, that's applicable to nurse practitioners, advanced practice physios, um, so right now it's, it's a bit challenging, but we've found creative ways to make it work. Uh, and physicians, PAs, and employers have been very creative with how they've been able to fund PA positions. So um, I know that that could be a whole talk on its own, but it's, um, I think it has to be, uh, you have to be a little bit creative with the funding to make it work. Um, just to add to that, um, I think that in depending on where you're practicing uh, for funding reasons, I think it's still, a, a viable solution to employ a PA versus a physician in, in like rural areas or um, places where physicians are not really likely to go or practice. So I think it's still a, good, a better solution maybe in some cases. To answer the last question um, in the job market in Canada to uh, at least in Manitoba, since I have started PA school, there always seems to have been more physicians available than there are grads each year, which is great. Um, so there's always the option to have a job right off the bat from graduation if you're not super picky on where you want to work. So to answer that last one there. Awesome. So it is 2 to 10. So thank you so much for taking a little extra time today. Um, so thank you everyone so much for attending and thank you. Uh, I hope you can join me in thanking our first year students, Dana, Laurel, Heidi, Jamin, Olivia, Selena, Carolyn, and Casey. Thank you to the practicing PAs, Carmen, Doris, and Anne for uh, answering questions about being a working PA. Thank you, Alexandra, for the amazing timeline infographics. And again, Anne, for helping me with the Facebook Live and getting that all set up. Um, overall, I'm really glad this, uh, this came together well. We had some technical difficulties, but we managed uh, as uh, the PA community usually does. <laughs> Um, so yeah, thank you everyone. Um, for anyone who wants the recording, just please uh, send me an email or DM me via Instagram. Um, I believe it will also be available on the Facebook page for replay. So uh, that is where you can access it. I'm sorry, we had more questions that our students wanted to answer and could answer, but uh, again, due to time, we couldn't get to them. But please, if, you, if your question wasn't answered, individually message the PA students. They are more than happy to help. Um, and it, you can also message me and I can direct you to the appropriate uh, individual. So thank you all and have a lovely day.